Welcome to Insights for Manufacturing, the podcast that supports the manufacturing sector with today's guest host, Miranda Birch. So this is a behind the scenes tour of Insights for Manufacturing, and you've probably had glimpses of Jeff Beecham as the host of the podcast and his depth of knowledge, which is going to be the basis of our chat today. And that knowledge, I'd argue, is possibly one of the most important issues facing you and your company. And that is finding the right leaders to take you through the next crisis, which we've had enough already, but there'll probably be more, or galvanising your teams through different times, or just getting to grips with pivoting, whatever it is. Getting the right leaders right first time is vital. So over the next 30 minutes, we're going to be exploring that world of executive search and headhunting. And we're looking in depth of what difference it makes, because I think we've all been there when we have thought we've got the right candidate for the job. And a few months down the line, we realise they're not a good fit for the company. And that is hugely costly in terms of recruitment and in terms of that demoralising impact on your team. And Jeff knows this. He's been immersed in this world of executive search and getting the right people for more than two decades. And it's also the foundation for his company, Authentica Resourcing. So I'm going to be exploring that topic right now. So, Jeff, I know the tables are turned. Um, I hope this doesn't sound too much like a recruitment interview. But from your perspective, what are the challenges facing manufacturing businesses at the moment to find the right leaders first? Yeah, well, that's a great question to start with, uh, Miranda. And, um, you know, all businesses will have a a number of reasons for, you know, hiring managers or or executives. You know, they they may need, uh, you know, to to up their bench strength. They may need to bring in uh, talent for specific projects, uh, which is where the interim would generally come in. There might be performance management issues, you know, even at board level, you know, Sometimes there are, you know, confidential searches that that need to be undertaken where the business will need to bring in talent from outside the organisation, you know, to replace somebody who's just not, you know, meeting the the objectives or, or or the strategy for the board. So, you know, there are always the challenges of finding the right people. Um, and I, what I would always say to to any client, whether it's at board level, uh, lower level management or even at shop floor, you know, look to your own network first. I think most organisations would probably do that anyway. Um, but even for businesses that, that are used to using executive search headhunters, um, it would be remiss of, of an organisation not to consider who is in their current network. Who do they know from a previous relationship? Because that might save them a bit of time. It might, um, yeah, it might save them a bit of money. But my, my caveat to that would be, you may know somebody who would be a, a really good fit for that role based on a previous relationship that you might have. But that is one person as a very, very tiny, minute particle of the potential candidate pool for that business critical hire that you have. So, yes, look at your your own network, um, but then maybe use that as a benchmark. If you've got a star individual that you know from a previous relationship, that really should be as close as you're going to get to a benchmark for what that external search might look like. Um, And then, you know, really working with an external headhunter, you know, there are always challenges, you know, there's a war for talent. Um, it's different at executive level that it would that it would be, you know, for example, if you were recruiting on the shop floor, um, you know, factories and warehouses need volume. They need volume skills, they need volume talent. Totally different ball game when, when you're talking at, at director level roles or, or the C-suite. Um, but my approach to this is, is you know, is, is pretty simple, really. To, to get the right hire first time, I, I have four uh, main uh, processes that I, that I go through before the search actually starts. And, and the first one is really to make my client's uh, hiring priority my number one priority. 
And that's quite unusual in itself because, you know, uh, uh, most recruiters will be working on a, a number of assignments. Um, you know, they, they could have half a dozen searches running at a time. Well, I'm a small business and I like to do things properly and I like to do things in a measured way. So I only operate one search at a time. Um, and that's up to the CV shortlist stage, of course. But, um, you know, working like that, I can totally immerse myself in my client's business, um, really get to know them, get to know the culture, get to know what does good look like for them. Um, and be laser focused on on my job, the job that they're paying me to do. So that that's the first point is, is making the client's hiring priority my priority, number one priority. The next one, you know, this this applies to any form of recruitment, and it's something that's that's uh, really frustrated me over many many years, well too many years to be honest, as you say, over two decades in recruitment. You know, is understanding the brief. It's such a simple thing, you know, but unless your recruiter uh, fully understands your business and not just the role that the, you're asking them to go out and recruit, but, you know, the impact of that role, the impacts of certainly getting it wrong um, and the impacts that recruiting the right person have for your business, but also for your customers as well. So, you know, it's, it's all about listening and understanding what it is the client are trying to achieve not just in hiring the right person but what what is the strategy what what impact does this role have on the overall business success number three is then you know an obvious one it's knowing where to look and you know having worked on both sides of the table in terms of retained search which is where i currently operate and contingent recruitment which is the more traditional method of advertising, database search, et cetera. Um, it really is about, you know, being able to lean in on, you know, a very advanced network that, that I've built up over many, many years. And um, this, again, I go back to, to the client and the client's customer objectives. It's knowing where to look in the right place. So having a great network is, is fundamental. Being able to ask my network for quality referrals on, you know, senior individuals that are, you know, known to these contacts in my network, um, it really is a valuable resource. So, you know, there's, we'll talk a little bit more about pro the process of headhunting, I'm sure, as we go along. But it, it really is as simple as knowing where to look. And not all recruiters can can honestly say that they you know before they start working on an assignment they know where to look i generally always know where to look before i commence a search um and then you know following that is is executing a robust search authentically and, and with purpose um and i say authentically and with purpose and, and by that i mean you know it's it's it shouldn't just be a transaction this is you know i i'm truly viewing myself when I'm when I'm retained by a client as an extension of their business so I have to represent not only my business but you know I'm representing the client but there's always you know there's there's, there's always three parties in a, in a recruitment project there's the client there's the candidate pool and then there's the recruiter and you know un unless everybody in that chain is doing everything they can to ensure a smooth process and, and a successful outcome, then th things will fall down. So as, as the recruiter or the headhunter, I'm, I'm normally the guy in the middle that, you know, um, I'm gonna be looking in the right places. I'm gonna have my client's best interest to heart all the time, but there's also the candidates can, to, to consider as well. So if you're not listening to the candidates, you could be missing signals that might end up in a in a wrong hire you know so having a um a high level of of due diligence throughout the recruitment process is intrinsic i can't underline or or, or overstate that enough it, it really is about it's not just about you know that old cliche getting all your ducks in a row yeah from a timing point of view yes but quality is is the is the, the the overriding value that that must be 
in abundance throughout the whole process and, and authentically it is is doing what's right so taking the brief from the client understanding them and then going out into market authentically you know giving as much information as you can in order to engage the right candidates but then listening to them and and you know making decisions with the candidate as to whether it might be right for them or not um so that's really where i where i start off with you know those those four sort of um key points to me they they always ensure that i get a, a successful outcome and and end up with the right person at the right time of asking um my caveat to that i suppose is that you know with recruitment we're dealing with human beings and, and human beings can be uh they they can they can change their minds they can you know throw curveballs at you in the very very rare circumstance that you know i might get a candidate to to offer stage and um the candidate changes their mind you know i can mitigate against that and it, it doesn't happen very often but in the when you when you've got a candidate that maybe sort of falters at the last hurdle um and and sort of doesn't accept an offer for whatever reason i'm pretty good at, at, at having backup plans and and being able to you know go back out to search quickly based on a good benchmark at that point um in order to get that assignment over the line so there's a lot of ground there and i'm just going to focus on one area where i think people for understandable reasons may be too narrow and you talked about early on that big pool that's out there a huge pool of talent and then actually reaching it so in your experience what does that big pool encompass is it about going beyond your sector is it about going beyond your normal network how far do you push the boundaries to get to that best talent yeah it, it's interesting and, and you you would have depending on which recruiter you're talking to you'll get different answers and um, different clients will have their own preferences so if a client's paying me a retainer to recruit somebody for them i've got to listen to them and if they're if, if they're narrow-minded themselves uh, it does create an awkward starting point because you know if, if they're from for example aerospace or automotive and they only want candidates that have got a proven background in that sector then for me you know I work on the on the on the on the basis of Pareto. So it's the 80-20 principle. Yes, a short list probably needs to be made up of 80% of exactly that. If they're hell bent on we only want automotive or we only want aerospace or whatever it might be, then then naturally, um, then you know, my short list would be made up of a majority of candidates from that background. And there are very good reasons why clients would insist on that you know and that's another topic for a, a podcast in itself i i suppose but i would always um uh, you know try and educate clients to the the benefits of looking outside of their own sector i'm not saying that they will find or you know always find better candidates outside of sector but unless you're looking under all the stones um you you might be missing out on an absolute gem of a candidate um so Going back to your original question, so headhunting, it's really, you know, if, if you're if you're going to recruit and you're a client and you, you've got a, a business critical role, first thing, you'll go to your, your network. Outside of that, you'll you'll go to an, an, an external headhunter. So what you need to do is to have a pool of, of potential talent and have a diverse pool of talent. And, and by that, I mean, you know not just individuals who are on the market quite often the people that i talk to are you know they're working permanently they're well looked after um they're, they're engaged with their current business they fit in and all the rest of it but it's about you know positioning an opportunity with them that might well move them to the next level of their career in a time frame that is more uh, suitable to them to what their current business can can provide so whilst people are generally they might be generally happy where they are there are normally you know reasons that they might have if you present them with the right opportunity they would consider a move so we've got to be talking to people that are happy in their current roles so these are the passive candidates that aren't necessarily looking on you know job boards or responding to adverts um 
we've got to be talking to uh, to other people in in the sector or in the the businesses that might be appropriate to harvest the talent from. So you know, quite often on a search, yeah, the first the first port of call is always who are the competitors to my client. Doesn't always mean to say that the, there will be uh, relevant or, or appropriate talent within those organisations, and quite often clients will say, well. We know all of our competitors. We, yeah, we, we've looked at them. Not really impressed with what they do. It, it does depend on who you talk to, but going down the competitor route isn't always the the preferred choice uh, for a client. Um, but you would you would have a look at the competitors and and map out those businesses. The next sort of port of call would be organisations that are of a similar nature to to my client. Um, and that might be from from a, a manufacturing process point of view. It might be they might not be in the same sector. So if it's an aerospace client, aligned businesses might not be in the aerospace sector, but they might have similar or the same manufacturing processes, but they just make things for other sectors. So those businesses would be, in my opinion, they would be totally relevant. Of course, you've got different standards that, that some sectors work to. So it's AS91 hundred for, for aerospace there's uh, you know ts 6949 and the newer one you know for automotive medical and, and food you know they they will um have their own uh standards that they have to work to so somebody coming in from outside of those sectors might not necessarily have the regulatory experience but there will be so many similarities in terms of maybe the structure of the organization uh, the manufacturing processes and, and and culture is another good one. If you can match um, potential businesses with your client, so if you can look at, uh, and, I, and I don't think this is looked at enough from a lot of recruiters, they, they just seem to go for like for like, I've got to get somebody from this sector and from this background. Um, but if you really know your market as, as a recruiter or a headhunter, you will know some of the other businesses uh, that will have a similar or the same culture as your client. And that's sometimes a really, really good starting point, because as we know, culture is such a big thing when it comes to uh, getting the right fit and, and getting the longevity out of a placement. Um, so, you know, there are databases, there are job boards. I don't tend to use them. Um, often if at all um you know it really is about my network talking to people getting to know um you know clients getting to know candidates so that they most of the people i talk to are at senior level anyway so usually any conversation i have could be either or it could be about an assignment it could be about is that company recruiting so most uh director level and and, and c-suites are you know are open to a discussion with a, a, a you know a good headhunter um because it may well they may well need the services on, on, on one of those two different routes so the the strong network the referrals knowing knowing my market knowing my customers market knowing who's who in the business is really where you can take some time out of a search but get to the right people quickly um, but just coming back to, you know, one, one of the main sort of challenges, really, you, you can you can match technical skill sets. You can match the, the qualifications, the level of experience, the proven track record and all of that sort of stuff. But, you know, uh, for executive search, it really is down to leadership competence, leadership style and culture fit. It really is. So um, I think. You know, too many recruiters and some businesses will err a little bit too far in in any one direction on those things. They'll um, they'll you know just focus on the sector experience, or they'll focus on um, all on culture, which is great, and all all on attitude, and you know drop the ball when it comes to skills. I will. I think it's probably worth noting um, something Simon Sinek has, has said on a number of occasions. You know. Uh, higher for attitude, you can train skills and or something like that. I agree with that. I really do. You know, if, if you haven't got candidates that have got the right attitude and certainly at leadership level, they've got to have emotional intelligence. So if they haven't got that right attitude, 
leadership capability and emotional intelligence, they can have all the skills in the world. It's not going to work. The only thing with that is, um, again, I'll go back to the 80-20 principle. Um, you, you've got to have the right sort of DNA to be a to be a leader. Some of it you can be coached on, you can be mentored on, you can, you can be taught. Um, but I think a lot of it has got to come down to the person you are and how you apply yourself in, in business. Um, but the skills side of things, for me, it, it is still important. But I would say 20 percent, you know, they've got to have the right background, the right skills. They've got to have knowledge about the industry, the processes, the standards, wh whatever it might be. Um, and then the 80 percent is obviously their leadership skills, capability and, and, and emotional intelligence and how they apply themselves. Um, so it's really important to to look at, you know, has the client identified the right fit? What does the ideal person look like in the first place before you've even started to recruit? Because um, quite often, you know, businesses, they might have a, a director, for example, an ops director or a uh, a business development director that's been in post for 10 years now that role might have changed over that period the company might look totally different to what it did 10 years ago the last time they recruited the structure of the organization might have changed dramatically so when was the last time they reviewed the the job description for that for that role and at senior level it, it's just so important that you know these are business critical roles so what does that individual do today? So if we're going to be replacing somebody, what does that job description need to look like? And not just what does the what does the job description need to look like, but where where were the gaps with the last person doing that role? Are there areas for improvement? Are there things that we need to change about that job description today to enable that leader to be able to perform um you know to the to, to the to the optimum of their capability for the future business needs as well so I, I think sometimes there can be an element of laziness um you know either with the the, the client in terms of you know not really giving a, a an up-to-date version of what they want and sometimes a recruiter might not ask enough questions around that you know because we're not recruiting generically at this level. We're recruiting for key leaders that are, I, I know I keep saying it, but they're business critical. So let's get it all out on the table, warts and all. What are, what are, what are the issues? Where would you like to improve? You know, um, how can you take the business to the next level? Is replacing like for like going to get the job done? So sometimes it's about asking those questions. And if the, if the client are totally um unanimous in what good looks like for for that hire then that gives a very clear message to the headhunter or the recruiter to be able to do their job properly wow it sounds like you're a combination of sort of a strategic business development person because you're forcing people to think really really forensically about where their business is going and where this new role has got to fit in and as you say take the last 10 months even things have changed so fast but it also occurs to me that you become an ambassador particularly if you're reaching out to those candidates who you call passive who are happy in their work and then suddenly you sow this seed in their mind look I represent this company have you thought about your next step and suddenly you're extending their horizon so I think it's I was going to ask you a basic question but you've answered it which is that difference between recruiters where you just stick an advert out there and hope for the best and actually the proactivity and the depth of knowledge that you and other people in executive search bring to the role. So thank you, that's been that's been fascinating. I am mindful of time though. And I, one question I wanted to ask you, particularly in relation to insights for manufacturing. Why, Jeff, why have you decided to specialise in manufacturing? Uh, well, it, it goes back to, I, I suppose, my my youth. Uh, you know, in a, in a previous life when I was a lot younger, um, I, I worked in manufacturing and production environments, um, albeit within uh, quality control. Um, but, uh, you know, I was used to working in a, in a sort of production environment and the, the, the sort of the environment and the and the mentality of, of working within quality has always stayed with me. 
Um, I'm not an engineer. Um, I'd, I'd make a, a terrible engineer. Um, but I, I'm very inquisitive. I love how things get made. Um, and I like to see in my work, you know, we, we've got the the people side of things, you know, recruitment. I, I've always recruited within engineering manufacturing um, and a bit of distribution. But working within manufacturing, really, whilst I'm recruiting at leadership level these days, there is always that connection to what are the products? What does the company do? What difference are they making in the world? You know, are they, you know, in, into, you know, renewables or any energy saving devices or do they supply the medical industry, healthcare? Are they keeping planes from dropping out of the skies? Are they, you know, producing components that go into defense systems? These are all things that affect all of us, you know, as, as human beings. Um, there's the food industry as well. Uh, capital equipment is another area that I recruit for. It all comes into manufacturing, really. But, you know, the, the, the equipment businesses, the, the machinery and production line businesses that, that make automation and, and production lines that make food, uh, they're keeping the country fed. Um, so it's really, really it makes a huge, huge difference. So I, I love to see how things are made. I love to learn about different materials, different machines. Um, I'm just really inquisitive. My brain is an absolute sponge. And uh, I think when when you and I spoke last year um, or earlier this year, you, you asked me uh, a, a similar question. And I think at the time I said, you know, I'm a little bit like um, the kid walking around Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. You know, manufacturing is just so exciting. It's it keeps evolving. Um, it, it's it's a, a, a real good foundation for our economy. People love to make things. We need manufactured products. So for me, doing my bit, recruiting people that are going to ensure that manufacturing businesses are successful and provide jobs for people in the local communities and keep producing, you know, great British made quality products. That gets me excited. But also the, the, the podcast, Insights for Manufacturing, um, I'm actually the, the, the sort of guest this week and you're, you're, the, you're the host. Um, that was born out of a, a passion for manufacturing. This particular episode is, um, is the odd one out really, because I always said to people, and I regularly say to people, Insights for Manufacturing isn't about me and it's not about recruitment. It shouldn't be about recruitment because I've done it. This is my side gig, if you like. It's my passion project. It's just linked to my work because I recruit for predominantly the manufacturing industry. So anything that I can do to support UK manufacturing, I will try and do. And I thought the podcast was a great way of, you know, getting people on that have got their own subject matter expertise that can give value to UK manufacturing. That's why I did it. And of course, it, it also at the same time gives people a bit of an insight into Jeff Beecham and, and my, a little bit about my personality and I, I suppose my level of knowledge or not, as the case may be, <laughs> depending on the subject. So, yeah, manufacturing is, is just a great industry. And just looking back, obviously the podcast is ongoing, but I just wonder, are there particular insights that you've gained your, yourself as a host that have stayed with you and may shape your work or just shape your vision? Wow, uh, well, crikey, how long have we got? We haven't got too long. Um, yeah, each and every guest that comes on the show is a great learning opportunity for me, you know, because we cover so many different topics. Um, you know, I've, I've had some of the, um, you know, the associations on the show, you know, either the, the sort of CEOs or presidents or founders of different trade associations talking about topics that are important to their members. Well, this is all, you know, each and every time it, it's, you know, it's a great opportunity for me to to hear what's going on with their members, you know, the things that are important. But not just reading something that's that's in mainstream media that's typically quite negative. Um, I'm learning more and more about um, different parts of the sector from professionals that are in these these pockets of industry, and that can only help my clients because my knowledge is is boosted every time. It helps my candidates as well because I, I can understand hopefully 
a little bit more about some of the things that they're coming across day to day in in their in their daily life as a, as an executive. Um, but there, there's there are so many. I mean, the, you know, the, the inaugural episode of Insights for Manufacturing was Terry Schooler, um, the chairman of the Institute for International Trade and Export. Uh, you know, that has been the the highest viewed episode by far on YouTube. Um, I think that might have been a little bit to do with the fact that he was such a great guest, but also it was the first one. So, you know, it had great momentum, um, but such a great topic as well, you know, particularly not long after Brexit. So ev every guest is special. You know, um, I had Professor Carl Chin on the show um, the other week. I've always been a fan of, of, of Carl, his passion for manufacturing, but also he's a, he's a huge personality around the Birmingham or West Midlands area. But then we were looking at the sort of social impacts of manufacturing to the region so for different reasons i'm always interested in in having a, a diverse range of guests um and hopefully you know the the podcast audience uh will get different topics and and get them thinking about things in a different way each time i, I hopefully um the, the the podcast is is certainly not more of the same each episode it's a different you know, a different person uh, talking about a different facet of, of, of manufacturing and how it impacts us all. Well, congratulations. And I hope your interviews carry on month after month. Thank you, Jeff. It's been great, really great talking to you. Thanks very much, Miranda. And thanks for coming on as the, as the guest host. Really appreciate it.